Hello, my name is Cheryl Knight. I'm a genetic counselor with City of Hope, and today we'll be talking about an introduction to cancer genetics. First, a little bit about my background. I've been a genetic counselor since 1992, focusing specifically on cancer genetics for the last 12 years. I've been with City of Hope for five years, and I'm board certified and licensed in 16 states. Because City of Hope genetic counselors are licensed in multiple states, this allows us to meet with patients via telehealth in the comfort of their own home to talk about genetic testing options. Today we'll be talking a little bit about genetic counseling and genetic testing with regard to cancer genes. First of all, we'll start with an overview of genetics and cancer genetics. Then we'll talk about hereditary cancer risk assessment and the genetic counseling process. And lastly, we'll focus on the specifics about the genetic counseling program at City of Hope. First, we'll start with some basics about genetics. What are our genes? Genes are packets or a collection of what's called DNA, which is a molecule which contains all of the instructions for how our body is going to function and develop normally. The DNA is collected into packets of information called chromosomes, which are contained in the center of the cell called the nucleus. If you can think of it, it's like an instruction booklet that will tell our body how to function normally and contains the set of instructions for all of our traits. We have genes that relate to eye color, hair color, and things like diabetes or heart disease. We each have two copies of every gene in our body. One comes from our mom and one from our dad, and that's how we become a blending of traits from our parents. We all also carry dozens of different genes that relate to a risk for cancer. These genes normally function to help to repair our genes and keep us healthy as we grow older. So for example, you can see on this slide a gene that's called the MET gene, or MET for short. This gene normally helps to uh, suppress the risk for kidney cancer. There's another gene denoted as MLH1. This is a gene that relates to a condition called Lynch syndrome, which can increase the risk for colon cancer and for uterine cancer for the women in the family. And then another gene that you may have heard about in the news called BRCA1 or BRCA1 is a gene that's commonly found to increase the risk for breast cancer and also ovarian cancer. These genes normally make proteins that help to repair our DNA, keep our cells healthy, and suppress tumor growth. But if someone inherits what's called a mutation or a variation in the genetic code that shuts down that normal process, then that person has a higher risk for cancer. This is being depicted here by what looks like a traffic barrier that would keep a car from running out of control. So we all carry two copies of the set of instructions that would help to suppress tumor growth, but someone may inherit a mutation or genetic variant or mistake that can shut down that normal process. So as you see here, the barrier is cut in half and can't prevent the car from running out of control. Therefore, this would allow the cancer cells to start to grow out of control and turn into a tumor. You will hear genetic counselors and doctors referring to mutations in several different arenas. First of all, let's talk about somatic mutations. These are acquired mutations. In other words, these are genetic mistakes in the DNA that have not been inherited. They're not passed down from generation to generation, but they occur within the cancer itself. These mistakes can happen from exposures to toxins in the environment or viruses or lifestyle factors like smoking that can actually damage the DNA. And if the cell acquires enough of these genomic mutations, then the cell will start to grow out of control. Genomic testing looks for these somatic mutations within the cells 
to help find out if there is any specific finding that could assist us in designing a targeted cancer treatment program with immunotherapy, for example. Germline testing refers to looking for germline mutations. That doesn't have anything to do with germs. It just means that these are mutations or spelling variations in the genetic code that are inherited in those original cells from the mother or the father and are present from birth. Therefore, these germline mutations are in every cell of the body. These germline mutations are what we're testing for with genetic testing. It's important that the genetic testing help figure out where is this mutation? What gene has it occurred in? Because that can help us to predict what types of cancer someone may be at risk for so that we can help customize a cancer screening program that's appropriate for them. This slide shows an example of a germline mutation in the BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene that's being passed down from one generation to the next. BRCA mutations can be passed down by either the mother or the father. You can see here that parent one is depicted as having the BRCA mutation or the little red stripe on one of the chromosomes. The other parent does not have the BRCA mutation. As the chromosomes sort themselves out during conception, there's a 50-50 chance that the BRCA mutation could be passed down to the next generation. If a child inherits the BRCA mutation, this does not mean they have a 50-50 chance to get cancer. It simply means that if they inherit the mutation, they have a higher chance to develop cancer than the average person. Most of the time, cancer is not inherited. As you can see from this pie chart, just about 10% of cancer cases, denoted by the bright blue piece of pie, are what we call hereditary in nature and due to an underlying inherited gene mutation. The light gray piece of the pie, or the majority of the time, cancer is not inherited, but is due to those, like I said, exposures to toxins in the environment or lifestyle risk factors like smoking or perhaps just the aging process itself that causes those somatic or sporadic mutations that can lead to cancer. The dark gray piece of pie is called familial cancer. That's where we may see a clustering of cancer cases within a family tree that are not due to just a single genetic change, but may be due to a familial trait. For example, people who inherit a tendency for acid reflux have a higher chance to develop esophageal cancer, but this is not due to a single gene that we can do testing for. So how do we sort out what kinds of cases of cancer are genetic or inherited versus those that are sporadic? We look for red flags, either in the person's personal history of, of cancer or in their family history. If someone has been, inherit, has been diagnosed with two different types of cancer, then that's certainly a red flag. Also, if they're diagnosed with cancer at a young age or under the age of 50, then that's another risk factor that makes us think that there could be an underlying hereditary cause to the cancer. Certainly, if someone else in the family tree has already been tested for a gene that's linked to cancer risk, that's another red flag. If we see rare cancers in the family tree, like ovarian cancer or pancreatic cancer, for example, then that's another red flag. Also, if we see multiple family members with related or associated types of cancer, so for example, breast, ovarian, and prostate cancer can indicate an underlying BRCA gene mutation. And so that would be another red flag if we saw multiple family members with those types of cancer. We also ask questions about your ancestry. In other words, what countries people were from before America, because there are certain population groups that have a higher chance to carry or um, inherit mutations that are linked to cancer. An example of this, of this is that within the Ashkenazi Jewish population or the Eastern European Jewish population, we see higher prevalence of BRCA mutations. 
if your doctor sees any of these red flags in your personal or family health history, they may refer you for genetic counseling and testing. So what is genetic counseling? It's a process or service that's provided by genetic counselors who are healthcare professionals who are trained to have expertise in medical genetics. During the cancer counseling process, we evaluate your personal and family history. We talk about the risks that there may be an underlying cancer gene running in the family. We talk about options for genetic testing. And of course, we would go over the um, results of the genetic testing with the patient and their family members to talk about how those genetic testing if, um, results in, have implications for the person's uh, health management going forward, and also to talk about genetic testing options for their family members as well. We want to try to empower the next generation of family members to make informed choices to prevent the, their risk of cancer. We believe that the genetic counseling process is important because it helps people to make individualized decisions about whether genetic testing is right for them. So let's go over an example of genetic counseling for this woman who's been recently diagnosed with uterine cancer at age 48. She may be confused about why she was referred for genetic counseling because no one in her family has ever had uterine cancer, but it's simply because she was diagnosed under the age 50 that's a red flag in her doctor's mind that we may need to do some genetic testing. The genetic counselor would explain that just because the patient has a genetic counseling session does not mean she has to have genetic testing. That's a very individual decision. During the genetic counseling process, we explain the different choices for genetic testing and help patients to decide what's right in their individual situation. So the first thing we do is collect a family history. We generate what's called a pedigree or a family tree to look for patterns of cancer within the family tree that may indicate an underlying hereditary cancer syndrome or condition. In this family tree, you can see circles and squares. The circles denote females, the squares denote males, and the colored symbols show the different types of cancer that each person has been diagnosed with. Our patient is denoted by the purple circle, and you can see she had uterine cancer at age 48. Her mother had colon cancer at age 48, which is again, a young age to be diagnosed with cancer. And we know that colon cancer and uterine cancer can be related in a condition that's called Lynch syndrome. This condition was discovered by Dr. Lynch, who found the MLH1 gene is linked to an increased risk for both of these types of cancer. If we look in the family tree, we can see that the patient's mother's brother had colon cancer as well at age 50, and another brother had prostate cancer at age 54. So these are those red flags that indicate the possibility there could be a cancer gene running in the family. We can contrast this with a family tree that maybe had no one in the family who had cancer, or maybe just an aunt with lung cancer, an uncle with esophageal cancer. Those are sporadic types of cancer that would not be red flags. So we have multiple family members who've had cancer at young ages. They are related types of cancer that may be due to an underlying mutation in a cancer gene. We're seeing uterine and colon cancer together, which may indicate Lynch syndrome. Genetic testing would be helpful because there are several different genes that can cause Lynch syndrome. And by figuring out which gene may be running in the family, that can help us to advise this patient and her family members about their future risks for cancer and how we can lower those risks through cancer screenings or other interventions. In this case, let's imagine that the patient doesn't understand the purpose of genetic testing because she's already been diagnosed with cancer. We would explain that there are several important aspects of the information that genetic testing can yield. For example, if we were to find a gene that's linked to cancer in specific cases, this can help to modify cancer treatment options. 
pertaining to what's called immunotherapy, which are medicines which can boost the body's immune system to fight against the cancer. As I mentioned before, genetic test results can also help to guide future cancer screenings. So this, per this person may be eligible for future cancer screenings like screening colonoscopy that need to be done more frequently or starting at a younger age than the average person. And then of course, as we mentioned before, this information can also impact family members in understanding their risk for cancer so that they can make sure that they're getting appropriate cancer screenings. We also help patients sort out any insurance issues that can come up during the genetic testing process. Thankfully, most insurance policies cover genetic testing for patients who've been diagnosed with cancer, but if not, we do have out of, or rather self-pay options that are roughly $250 as an option for people who are highly motivated to proceed with genetic testing, even if it's not covered by insurance. In this particular case, because this patient has been diagnosed with cancer at a young age, it's very likely that her insurance would cover the genetic testing for her. So let's imagine this patient had genetic testing, which found a mutation in the MLH1 gene. This means that she does indeed have what's called Lynch syndrome. This means that she has a higher chance to develop gastrointestinal cancers than the average person, and that she'd be perhaps an, uh, also a good candidate for targeted therapies. This means that we need to set her up with future cancer screenings that will be more rigorous than the average person. It also means that what's called her first degree relatives, which are her parents, her siblings, and children are eligible for genetic testing to look for that same genetic marker to see if they have a higher risk for cancer. This information can help them make better informed decisions regarding their future health care. So now we'll turn to some specifics about the genetic counseling program at City of Hope CAP. City of Hope CAP stands for our campuses that are in Chicago, Atlanta, and Phoenix, while the main campus for City of Hope is in Southern California. All of the City of Hope CAP um, genetic counselors work remotely and we're licensed in multiple states so we can meet with patients via telehealth in the comfort of their own home to talk about genetic testing options. We can set up genetic testing when they return to the center via either a blood draw at the time of their regular visit, or we can also ship a saliva kit out to the home for a saliva sample to do the genetic testing that way. We have several members of our team. I'm based primarily in Atlanta, but I also meet with patients in Chicago. Eric Fowler is our manager and meets with patients who primarily are based in Chicago. Laura Moreno is the genetic counselor who's based with me in Atlanta and also sees patients in Phoenix. And Erica Holt is based primarily in Phoenix, although she also meets with patients in Atlanta and Chicago. We're supported by a wonderful genetic assistance team Abby Rowan is our genetic counseling assistant in Chicago. Christy Daniel is our assistant in Atlanta. And Valerie Garcia is our genetic assistant in Phoenix. So how do patients get a referral to our genetic counseling services? As we were saying before, the doctor may review a patient's family history and see some red, red flags that indicate a referral. Sometimes we will discuss cases at our tumor boards and we'll identify a patient that's appropriate for genetic counseling that way. We also take what's called community referrals, where an outside um, doctor or nurse practitioner has identified a family history that indicates the need for genetic counseling or genetic testing. We also do take self-referrals, especially for family members where there's been a gene identified within the family tree that's linked to cancer, and that family member would like to pursue genetic testing for themselves. The next step is for the provider to make the referral, and then for our genetics assistants to set up that appointment with the genetic counselor. The typical visit lasts about 30 to 45 minutes. We go over the family history. If the if the patient decides to proceed with genetic testing, we can achieve the consent process through email and then set up this, the collection for the DNA in order to proceed with the genetic testing. 
It typically takes just a few days to get scheduled for a genetic counseling appointment. And if there is a need for an urgent referral, we can see patients on a next day basis. So let's review the basics of a genetic counseling and genetic testing process. The first thing we do is review the family history. We talk about the chances for different genes that may be running in the family and explain the different options for genetic testing. We also assess whether there could be some psychosocial issues that may relate to the patient's decision for genetic testing. Is this going to create additional anxiety at an already stressful time when a patient has a new cancer diagnosis? Are there any issues with insurance? We also help with that. And then of course we would put in place the consent forms and talk about how to set up um, getting the sample for genetic testing. It takes about two to three weeks to get the results back and then we would meet again to go over the results of the genetic testing. The results would be communicated to the referring physician or provider and of course we would talk about genetic testing options for family members as well. The genetic test results will always be stored within the EPIC chart and available through the patient portal. If need be, we can supply patients with their own hard copy of the genetic test report to share with their family members. And of course, as I mentioned before, we communicate the results to the referring provider and talk about recommendations for future health care for that particular patient. It's never a one and done situation with a genetic test result. If people have questions, they're welcome to reach out to the genetic counselor so we can review the information. We oftentimes will also supply a summary letter and a packet of information pertaining to the test results that patients can also share with their family members. So for patients who are interested in genetic counseling or genetic testing, how can they get an appointment? The first step is to talk to your provider. If you're getting care at City of Hope already, they can make that referral for you. If you're not getting care at City of Hope at this time, there is an online registry of genetic counselors throughout the country at the National Society of Genetic Counselors website. Of course, you can always reach out to our team and I've put our contact information here. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions about today's presentation. And thank you for your time.